I'm going to present here tonight um, a few fairly recent projects, fairly recent because as you know architecture takes a long time to be, um, to be built. As Lorena was mentioning, I, I really work at the articulation of, of disciplines and, and genre from, from urban scale, at very large scale, urban planning to landscape. Um, and then uh, um, design at very small scale and, and through it also architecture and 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 it's the articulation precisely of, of the scales genre and also research and practice with a continuous contamination of both uh, of both sides writing also and curating exhibition is also an important part of the work that really motivates and has motivated my practice um, also like the, the references from elsewhere this is an image of a brain map, a neuronal map by Santiago Ramon y Cajal that I always show, it was shown at the Istanbul Art Biennial where I did the project uh, under the direction of Karolin Christoph Bakargiev and, and, and I think that there's a link in between this map and, and, and also the urban maps of networks and infrastructure, uh, hidden networks um, that shape the city and territory is much more than we would talk, think. I'm, I'm quite interested in, this is another image you might know of the first X-ray um, by R Röntgen, where also you see the structures, the bones uh, that you don't normally see. So that's, that's this idea of that what really matters is, uh, mm, is what you don't see. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a sort of red thread uh, throughout all my work. This is uh, an image from an, the artist of Anya Soliman, with whom I've been collaborating for the Istanbul uh, Art Biennial, uh, and it's the dark matter. So it's again what what, may, what makes up most of the universe, but um, but you don't see. Um, we've been doing a project together um, in Istanbul. Here you can see a little bit of the different scales uh, and approaches from you know from the smaller was a pavilion for the Sao Paulo Architectural Biennial and the bigger one, a master planning for, for Geneva, 240 hectares. Uh, I'm, I'm starting with a, with a recent project that was like awarded the uh, Cultural Building of the Year in, uh, in 2018 in France. It's the result of a collaboration with uh, Swiss architects HHF. Um, and I was the, the leading architect for it. So it's, it's a competition that we, we won in 2018. 11, so you see that's sort of recent works, it takes really a long time to get built. Um, for, and the initial call um, was for a series of three buildings, um, a, a museum, visitor center, a restaurant, and then an observatory, a lookout point, and, and a smaller series of infrastructural um, follies in a park of 113 hectares just outside Paris that you can see in the picture in black kids, that's water, in between urban sprawl and, and nature and sort of artificial and built environment. Um, that's why this project goes for, so far only two uh, buildings have been built, but it's, it goes as Poissy Galore, it's uh, the editor of wallpaper, Elise Tataki, that, that knew about my fascination for James Bond and the fact that in a, just one competition we won this this number, this little collection of follies, and that's how it goes. This is a picture of it as it's built. You can see the observatory. So the park was landscaped by Agent Ster, French landscape architects. You can see here in this series of pictures, um, this is La Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier, uh, which is not far, it's in Poissy. And the roof, this image I'm showing is fairly important because of the of this hole in the roof is this window in the in the rooftop that, um, that for for Bouzier was very important. Like this idea that you frame to to see landscape, you need to frame it. So this this framing thing is also very important in all my work. It relates to the history of cinema. It relates even to you know, Peter Greenway film, The Draughtsman Contract, and it relates to you know, just seeing and the fact that you need a limit to. Um, to see it's particularly in, important for, for landscape. You need, you need to think of the views you're designing. Um, and this is, you know, this is framing in another way. It's a, like a, a very recurring, uh, I don't know how to, to, to put it, like less loud. It's a, it's a famous scene in Blow Up. It's a film by Michelangelo Antonioni. Michelangelo Antonioni um, 
is also constant, a constant reference for all my work. And had he been a filmmaker, he would have been an architect. So, so architecture is really important. Space is really important in, in, in this world. And this is this, this famous scene where David Hemmings is, sh is shooting Berushka. Um, and m more references of about this film come come later for a project landscape project I did in in another in another part. This is a very long. I, I don't put it all, otherwise we will stay here um, too late. But I, I, I uh, you should really watch this film. It's a very sexy um, scene. This one. But going back to the project, so uh, so it was a series of follies, but with like a public competition, so like quite limited budget. So I had on two kind two sets of constraints. So on one side uh, to find like a strong enough conceptual idea, and and and, uh, and for me it was really about framing the landscape. This this big park, again in between sprawl and 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 domesticated nature and and almost wild nature. It almost feels like Africa. It's very textured uh, park. Um, and then the other the other constraint was also more more prosaic, more uh, more practical. It was about uh, having a limited set of details and constructive uh, uh, solutions to uh, just not to explode the budget and finally not to be built. So we came up with this idea of different it's a family of different set of frames of different um, sizes that would uh, give very different ambiance when combined together. So with different uh, angles, but all prefabricated and quite quite simple to construct. And you can see some study models of the secondary infrastructure of follies, such as the theater uh, and an open uh, and an open air um, place for meditation and, and so forth. So here again, you have aerial views, and you can see how on one side, on, on, on this side, this is quite uh, not rough, but it's sort of middle class, and it becomes rough there, and, and that the other side is very affluent. So th there's always been this dichotom this kind of dual nature in the side, and it's also nature, almost wild nature. There are some beautiful barges over there. And that's also uh, there at the time Le Corbusier built La Villa Savoie um, because of car manufacturing. So you have this dual, really, nature of city and nature, city and water, um, artificial and built, but also social. It's a very, it's a very affluent and a very deprived area. Um, so the park, in a way, has to do like a, a liaison, has to sort of to connect these these two realities and and the buildings in the park. So you can see the boat there. This is the observatory, and that is the museum. <coughs> have also this this connecting uh, function. Some more aerial views. So you can see in, in, in those images also the, the the nature that is very textured. It's very it's green and grays and, and browns and, and it's um, so you will see how I react to it inside the, the museum. That's the observatory and that's the the museum. And so they all both structure. They look quite different, but they all are conceived out of the same frames, combined in a different way. So we start with this. Uh, museum, it's called Insects Museum because it hosts <coughs> a collection of um, uh, insects that are alive. So it's not like a natural, it's, it, it's the, also the headquarters of the National Association, French National uh, Association, that sort of cultivates, sort of breeds insects and then ships them all over. Um, and another um, Another part in the program was also to have like a space for temporary exhibition about uh, environment and contemporary art, like very very specific and focused. And then, um, as you can see, it's five main uh, it's five main uh, bodies, but it's and I don't know if you can see here uh, in the drawing that the the beans have different orientations. So in, and it's this way here, and then here this way, and then those those elements are quite simple. Like um, really quite straightforward to build, but where they in, where they like interconnected, they create a certain complexity. But starting with very simple elements, and you have in the middle, um, it's an exhibition space, the permanent exhibition space, and over there the um, 
it's the temporary space and then you have laboratories and offices and but it's a small structure it's roughly it's a bit less than 2000 square meters uh, with the technical places and from outside it's it's um, so it's timber and polycarbonate <coughs> with the views <coughs> that are quite limited and, and the frame specific points in the landscape but otherwise it's almost as a sort of preschool set of toys that are like put together and um, and so the, the aspect from outside is quite introverted um, and also at night the building becomes a sort of lantern and sort of um, emanates lights toward the um, the park um, as you can see in those images here you, you see again the the nature that is almost African to me so it's almost it's it's really very different from uh, any other park experience you would have in uh, in um, in the Jardin de Luxembourg or the Tuileries, where everything is perfectly manicured, um, you have a certain roughness. Um, and in here, you see here like the the way the building becomes at night, a sort of lantern, and and also in this image, you can you can see the way the the openings are distributed. Um, in the building, so it, it looks like a, a house in a way, like but the scale is slightly uh, bigger. It's more like of naval architecture. So that's that's an image before the exhibition was set. So the, this, these people are all staffed, all fake. No, not fake. I mean, <laughs> they're real. But I was I was fearing I was fearing really edutainment scenography. We had a contract for for the exhibition design, which is something I also do a lot in my work. Um, but there was, you know, in France, that's a public project, so there, there are always um, changes in the politics, and sometimes projects get stuck, or sometimes in the sort of different whims and desires that come into place. So, so at one point we didn't have control on what was going to happen inside and, and a sort of hardcore entertainment project might have happened. So that's when I called so Ivan Ban who took the photos for, for the project. He, he came twice and, and, and here it's like mostly all people in the office and, um, and my son Tazio who mm -hmm. are doing staffage here but that's the main exhibition space that's here again. <laughs> and that's a, a butterfly case. Again, the, the, the plants are also fake in this image. Um, but you can see the space and you can see the, this, big, um, this big opening towards the park where they also wanted to put like silhouettes of trees to explain so there are trees on the other side and I had really to be very tough um, with it. But you can see also in those images that the space inside is quite soothing, it's quite white, it, it's different shades of it's different shades of white, white on timber. <coughs> when uh, we won the competition, it was very timber and wood, um, an ecological showcase and so forth. But then being on site several times, I thought I would hijack this this point and sort of do something different, even though you're like not really allowed. You should stick to what the competition entry was. But I thought that the nature is so outside is so again green and brown and grey and, and, and rough that we needed a kind of counter, some a balancing um, a balancing environment inside. So it's like uh, Andrew Ayers, who's a dear friend and also an architecture critic for Pinup and, and, and several other magazines called it like High Market Swiss Clinic for Mental Disorders. So the when you first see so the the place because there's this this soothing this, this suiting an environment given by the by the white, and here you can see also the the what, the complexity of those you know of those um, frames when the two uh, different structures come come together, um, and uh, that's the, the that's the space for temporary lobby space, and then next to it the temporary exhibition. And that's <coughs> what it was. So I, I thought really like a lot not to have a complete like um, plastic, colorful plastic and um, scenography inside. And then I was quite pleased in the end because this is very, again, we're not, it's not a David Zwirner or Larry Gagosian's gallery. It's like for every kind of public. It's, it's quite mainstream if you want to. But I, I, I really like thought a lot to have something 
in a way that wouldn't be too edutainment or too mm, you know too playful not not in a good way so that's that's the the final scenography and <coughs> so we could do reshoot it after words and then if I go to the observatory an important reference is for, for, for me when when I started architecture first I didn't want to start architecture uh, I wanted to be in fashion and then this I Italian fashion designer Emilio Pucci who you might have um, heard uh, of who did this colorful lycra prints in the 60s. He was a friend of my grandfather. He was with him in Switzerland during the Second World War. And he met me in his 80s, still very glamorous and still very attractive. And he sort of managed to convince me to be an architect. <laughs> so, so, and then I'm still frustrated today, highly. But since it was a video put, then I would be an architect. And, um, but another, when I started being an architect, I started a lot with landscape, um, inspired by the British landscape gardens from Blenheim Castle to um, Rousham and Stowe and Storred, and the work of William Kent and John Capability Brown and, and, and so forth, Alexander Pope and so forth. All, the, all those references were really very important and I was fascinated. I also studied um, Asian gardens and theory of gardens in Asia. So this idea of impermanence, this idea of like ever changing was very much um, on my mind, very, very, very important as opposed to the stability and the firmness of, uh, of architecture which is not entirely true because even buildings age, evolve, and, 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 and have a life. But, um, but in a way, gardens, um, you know, you deal with sort of matters that are alive and with, with elements and atmospheres but much more and, and, and seasons and fog. So that's what, that's what was attractive to me. And then also those parks in particular, this is a view of Russia, and, are important also because of this idea of framing uh, again because you know in all those parks you have either follies or um, little buildings such as Grecian temples or Gothic temples or whatever pagodas or whatever or in this case it's just a statue that sort of indicates the the axis of views where you should uh, look at and so that that was like a, a major reference for the observatory um, of which you see here some constructive details. We were with very good engineers, Evie uh, Payne, Paris, and then Puxas in, 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 uh, in Basel uh, to achieve a sort of lightness as in the exhibition, uh, in the um, competition um, design. Again, it's this same frame that is a frame, it's like a, a simplified shape of a, of a house <laughs> overlapped in a sort of sense, uncanny sense of like instability. You see, it's almost as if the the little house was going to um, to fall, but of course um, it doesn't. This observatory was classified as work of art and not architecture to to really keep all the health and safety um, regulations. And it really doesn't have any other function but like being a lookup point and, and framing views. Um, do in a dual way again because when you're on the top, you can see different different sides. Um, you see there's, there's some. These are the structural studies. Um, you can see different different aspects of the park, but also when you're in the park or even in the city, you you have it like this. This presence uh, appears almost as a strange insect itself. So, and and the different views you can see the different angles offer different perspective on on these objects. What I like very much on it is <coughs> that it doesn't really have a, a function. Really, it's a lookout point. There's nothing to no, I mean, of course you can meditate, but there's no prescribed function. It's not a cafe or, or anything like that. You know, it's a reference also to the Parc de la Villette with all Bernard Chumis, um follies also in the ambition of this park that is part of the Greater Paris Grand Paris uh, projects. Uh, what I like about it is particularly is the sensation you when you're up there of vertigo, of almost falling, like this, this un unstable balance. So again, there's this, this idea of instability that for me is very fascinating. This is again staffage during the, sta the staffage shooting, so that these are all fake uh, visitors <laughs> with my son Tazio, so there with red trousers, so I had to do very tough negotiations from Virginia, I was in Virginia at the time of the, of the when the photos were made and I had to really 
negotiate really hard for him to skip school. This is on the day of a, on a summer day, on the day of the opening, so you see how it works as a lookout point. We go back to winter again. And you see the presence, it gets almost round in vegetation, but also it's quite important from, from the city. And, and this park has become a sort of a design destination at the scale of metropolitan Paris now. Um, this one is, a, uh, is an older project. It's like, um, could it blow up like the Antonioni's film we've seen a scene before. <coughs> it's, a, it's the park for a museum of modern contemporary and outsider art in northern France. Um, it's a museum that was built almost 30 years ago by Roland Simonet, who did also the Picasso Museum in, in Paris. And then at the time when I won the, a commission for the park, which is a sculpture park, um, uh, also an extension was being built by French architect Manuel Gautran to, to host a quite important donation of outsider art. So it's a condition a bit like the Mike uh, Foundation or, or the Louisiana in, in Copenhagen. So it's out of the city and it's, and it's in between countries, in between France and, and Belgium. It's in France but it's very close to Belgium. And, and the Netherlands, and it's, it's a good museum with a good programmation. So this is another scene in Marion Park in East London where um, David Hemmings is uh, shooting the two lovers and, and then by blowing up this image he finds like um, some elements um, of, um, of a murder. So that's, that's all about the film. And, and these two lovers remind me of a sculpture that is in the park as well. And the fact that the, you can see this is a photo plan, this is water. A, a little river, and that kind of axis there was created by the the donor. So this 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 museum was done uh, with the donation of an important industrialist family of, of, of northern France, um, and uh, the guy Mazurel was very very involved in the construction. So there was this idea of that there should be this this line that we prolonged. Um, and also this set of trees, and then the sculpture outside are like um, they, you know, the, the visitors go from inside and out, and the views are also constantly recording from a place to, to, to the other. And so outside, it's almost like um, an open air gallery. Uh, part of the um, scope that I had was to reposition the, um, the sculptures as well. And then I redesigned the uh, topography like making it slightly geometrical, as you can see this model, then prolong this, 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 this path that was there right at the beginning, edited trees, replanted trees, opened up uh, a river promenade, and then opened up, also did some patios, but mostly connecting the park to other parks that are, and then um, that are more metropolitan scale. And so this is another scene, I'm not showing it all, um, completely, but it's, it's also an Antonio, it's a professional re reporter. Can't, I can't remember the, it's a film of 75 with Jack Nicholson and, uh, and Maria Schneider, the same that did last time in Paris. And, it's, and this is a very famous scene in cinema because it, it was done with a steady cam at the time where like technologists were not like technologists today and you have this camera that goes from inside the room to outside in this um, Spanish uh, square in, in, southern, in southern Spain and, and then inside again. And the main scene is Nicholson that is, um, that is, is dying here, is being murdered here, and, and, but you don't really see the scene until when he's dead. He's dying, it's like he's a man on the, who's trying to escape. Uh, I'm very fascinated with the story uh, as well. He's, 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 he's a journalist, in, a reporter in Africa, and he wants to change his life. He wants to change identity and have a fresh start because his wife has affairs in London, is bored with his job, is bored with everything. And so he wants to change, um, and he meets somebody in Africa uh, <coughs> where he's reporting, and then this, this man he meets is, is murdered. Uh, and he takes, he doesn't know why, but he takes the, he sees an opportunity to, to take the passport of this person and, 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 and have, his, have this new identity. And then he starts um, also working as a sort of 
weapon smugglers or something it's like really an, an adventurer. <laughs> and then the men who were an, after this guy, already killed, go after him and then he dies. So it's about, you know, Antonioni is like the master of also existentialism, the fact that they, this, this really no escape from where you are. But I'm not showing this, this is like really, mm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going in, in different directions, but this scene is important for me for two, thing, for two, two aspects. Again, one is, again, that what you don't see is what is really important, and it's hidden. It's or not it's hidden or elusive, but it's not iconic. It's not immediately um, shown. Uh, and then the, the second aspect is this, this framing and, and the way the camera goes back and forth, which is important in this project, in the way you go back and forth the museum and you interact with the sculptures. Of course, these are like elements that you could see in the space or, or not, not so directly. But this is like an entry space, a, a patio. <laughs> Everything is strictly green and working on the te text. It is a nice image with the Picasso sculpture. So it's all about, <coughs> there were trees already. <coughs> so I got rid of trees, which was very complicated <laughs> because it's something you're not supposed to do, but it's important to edit landscape also when there's two much elements and sometimes it's, there's a disturbance. And then again, it's all shades of green, um, different textures. The trees that were added were added for the qualities when you know, the, the leaves make with the wind. And so it's very subtle. You can barely see this being an architectural intervention. The light is sometimes, is sometimes very <laughs> intense, but that's for regulation, again, health and safety issues. Otherwise, there was this decision not to put light directly on the sculptures, so they're like kind of ghost-like. This is the, build, the new building by <coughs> Manuel Gautron, and we insisted with her to have the light coming out of the building, like in Poissy in a way. And, and, and here it is a little film. You can see this kind of atmosphere here, that's a called there, and then there's a programmation that is continuous in, in, in the park with new uh, sculptures coming. The, the museum director, she's, she's a very good art curator, she was at some, at some point frustrated with so much greenness and, and kind of rigor. And because I very much, I mean, I like landscape for the reasons I mentioned before, for that kind of legacy, but I don't like a certain you know, easy narrative, so oh, too much floral presence. Some, I mean, some, some very floral gardens are wonderful. On the work of Gertrude Jekyll is wonderful, but <laughs> that's not what I do for me. Really, plants are like concrete or cashmere. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. It's the it's the juxtaposition of materials that is important to me. So, um, so again, if you do an interior or, or a landscape or even a garment, maybe I think it, that would be the same. Um, principles that I would follow. So I'm, I'm interested really in this juxtaposition of rough and smooth or, or, and, and, uh, and the sensuality of the material. So that's, that's what I tried to do <coughs> here and not to kind of disappear because there were already the museum, the sculpture, the extension of the museum, lots of presences. But the museum curator was then <coughs> frustrated and then she finally um, commissioned to a Belgian artist <coughs> a, a work of art that involves that is being, that is now there <coughs> that involves seeding. So it's a work of art. So she did exactly the same thing I did with the observatory, a classified work of art. And, and so here you have like a, a line of color over there, which I find sort of fair enough and, 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 and very and, and very smart not to kind of appropriate the thing. And I think it's also quite beautiful. Um, but again, the way I work here is like almost to disappear, to be very, so it's, it's a different work than you'd see another work in Norway where it's like, it's the contrary of disappearing, it's being uh, iconic. And for me, you, you know, it depends, everything depends on the situation you're in. So sometimes you want to disappear and be very discreet and be very understated and sometimes you need more, more presence and more statement, it's, it's, so it's not. It's never the same kind of approach. It's the, the approach is is, is de depends very largely on the on the situation you're you're in. Um, so that's the oldest project uh, so far that <coughs> that we 
one when Sannes Tavanger was then capital of Europe, European capital of culture. Um, so it's a project that is already 10 years, and I think that I had a student here last year, Esther, uh, that has grown up in the city Sannes, close to Stavanger, which is the second um, city in Norway. Um, it's a city that is relevant for oil and it's very fast growing, but that didn't have much, um, that much, that many symbols or many, um, or, you know, presence. So there, there was uh, a competition launched for, for a shelter, for like a canopy, an urban structure uh, that would be like host multi-purpose activities and then public realm all around and then the brief call for the use of wood in uh, innovative way, that's why it's called Norwegian Wood, like the Murakami novel and then the Beatles song before, before that. And here again you can see that it's this kind of the same frames that, that, that were mm, present in, the, in a much later um, project. And here the inspiration was um, those were those farms, um, you can see some different times of the day and the night, those farms just outside the um, just outside the well, every every city in Norway, and it's uh, it's elements where you keep store food so that it's not eaten up by animals and they're like lifted. So it's of course they're not built like this; they are completely in timber. This is a time lapse <coughs> that we show it uh, throughout 24 hours, and um, mm, so of course it doesn't look exactly like this. But uh, this is a reinterpretation, a more forward-looking reinterpretation. Let's say. Of such um, of such an element that is very familiar. Um, so for for us, and we did this with a architectural practice called Atelier Oslo, who followed the on-site construction. Um, is um, it was important to um, to really refer to the um, existing element, element, very embedded in in the collective memory and then sort of twist it a bit and, and sort of make it like more forward looking and uh, it's very simple it's a very sort of abstract um, figure um, in, in even to its borderline because sometimes it's too complex it's also opposite to the former project in a sense that here for something very small for such a small project the number of details and like uh, different details is, is sort of it's kind of crazy, and it was given by different situations also with, with the client. But anyhow, you have this envelope that is very abstract, and there's no primary and secondary structure. It's all nine per nine uh, double grid in timber, as you can see <coughs> over here, o over which you have a series of shingles, glass shingle, shingles that are posed and printed with a pattern so that you know you have different, different. Mm, with the, when the clouds are rolling on it, and then with different lights, you create different reflections also on the on the floor. Um, and then the uh, the structures that sort of uh, rooted to her to the ground are like almost like a gothic tree, and they become benches um, as well. So they're like very uh, very much not simple. That's it in the. In the Langata, which is the local high street, so it's like a sort of commercial center, um, so it gets uh, <coughs> really like um, almost confused with the, with the other houses. And what was surprising, and Esther was grown up um, during a teen years pre-university year, she was she was there with this uh, with this object just being built, and uh, she confirmed it how much this has been you know appropriated, made made their own by 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 everybody in the town. So right now you have the tour of Norway in the bicycle tour of Norway that starts from there, or you can have yoga, you can have markets, you can have music playing and all sorts of things. And the idea was to <coughs> so create this object that would be not just a canopy, but a sort of activator of public space in a culture where you don't really meet that much out in a square or even in a high street because of climate, because of darkness at night, even though summer days are very long. So we wanted to bring um, to the north this more southern, uh, southern approach to, to, the public, to the public space and to the fact that public space can be inhabited and, and also uh, appropriated in a very informal way. Um, 
again, this project did the cover of many magazines, it's, it's, and, and you can see it's very much not discreet. It's very, well, iconic is a word that I wouldn't say, but it's very striking in a way, and it's very unsubtle as well, no, if, you could, if you wanted to criticize it. But, um, but I believe that was like a, a design attitude that was very much needed in this particular situation, but it's not necessary at all times. And, uh, and this is like a completely different scale of project, like the only light motif that you have read thread is that it's also like a public project. That's an article, the article I'm most proud I've ever had it in the New York Times in the financial section, in the business section. And it's a good article also to, to read because it explains really well what La Défense, which is Paris Central Business District, did. And we got this big commission to, um, to, to the, a double commission. So one as master planners, urbanists, and another one as designer with my French uh, then colleagues. Um, so the, um, the master planning uh, was to re regenerate in a way and to, to sort of bring to new um, to new light and to bring to new life also like uh, the, the businesses that was set up after Second World War and was like uh, bringing an idea of, of a modernity that was like uh, already obsolete. Um, and so the master plan that we did for the public space and subterranean space is the first <coughs> after comprehensive one after 64. Um, and then we also designed the big public space, 70, 70,000 square meters public space below La Grande Arche towards Nanterre. So here is an aerial view of La Défense where you can see this boulevard circular. I'm showing this project quite quickly because otherwise it, it's, it's a very complex enough project. But you, this is an image of Le Corbusier again, it's the Plan Voisin of 29 that was never built but made Corbusier relevant and famous where he was proposing to basically demolish everything big, like even bigger than Haussmann, Baron Haussmann, and, and get rid of most any old building in Paris and, and build new ones, and but also separate a vehicular flow from pedestrian flow. And um, and of course this was many years later, was in, at, again, the La Défense, the first stone was set in 58, that was happened. You see, you, it creates this kind of disconnection, work, working on, on decks and slab, and in the case of La Défense, we have six levels uh, underground with, with sort of um, infrastructure, uh, trains, and, 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 and there's a national route, <coughs> there's a metro, there's all sorts of things, um, nightclubs, uh, uh, atelier for artists, there's all, all sorts of things underground, but also that creates a certain disconnectivity. So La Défense was already in a higher point, it's called La Défense because it's defensive. Um, and this is like a, an image around the boulevard circular, you could be in Asia, you could be everywhere, you know, it's not, it doesn't look like Paris or the Paris, the postcard Paris idea that we, we have in mind, but it's quite striking to see those, those bridges that connect, this is another one, that are uh, about 30 or more of them that connect La Défense to all the neighbors around. And then this is the kind of situation that you have for six levels below, so parkings that are greatly underused because the public transportation works quite well. So we were asked to give a vision to make the site attractive uh, again because the site is suffering from a vacancy rate of 20% or more because it's, this is no tax incentives, other, and then this idea of modernity that was shown here in Paris very much and very much Jacques Tati um, playtime that was shot there was, uh, was very soon obsolete. So, and, and this idea of also of like separating flows and separating also programming, zoning, um, so it's a business district, it's nothing else, is very, very um, obsolete. So that's a quote I like by Eddie Heathcock, is the crit architecture critic for the Financial Times, and, and, and so he talks about of embrace of complexity, and that's very important, and also the fact that the you know, you can't really change a place like this. So we were sort of went into mapping below, above, and below, <coughs> and producing, it's about, it's hundreds of, of different thematic maps, and then 
looking really at, at each single aspect, making a planning of transformation above, above and below for the next 20 years, and then proposing specific changes along the grand axe and uh, you know sort of so before and after of course it, this is not a project so it's not a design project but it's so it's more it's mostly setting intentions to revamp um, the site and also using under under use and living our spaces for to bring in new functions such as pools etc retrofitting parkings like, uh, you know, again, not demolishing and, and, and building all over, but like working more on retrofit and then the night nocturnal aspects um, of it. And of course, bringing in nature, which is something very difficult because it's also built on a slab. This is an image of the, an exhibition that took place about the project at La Defense itself. There's a, there's a little film showing showing uh, especially the, the, the nature of it. So it's 161 hectares, so it's, it's quite big. And here you can see, and it's really like a multi-layered um, element uh, where, um, you know, this, 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 this thing in black is, the, is a deck. So it's 30 hectares, it's the biggest in Europe <coughs> deck. And so it means you have these six levels below. Um, it also creates lots of winds, lots of emptiness, um, lots of disconnection in a way, and also logistical um, issues. Uh, it's very complicated to build on a deck, to plant a tree on a deck, and so forth. And then underneath, there's this uh, crazy labyrinthic world on, 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 on six different levels. And um, here you can see it's very polished and jacques tati, um, smooth on top and then below where you have a situation also that it's you have sort of Paris Grand Central is here because there's a metro station here you can see also as the metro from the sand from the river goes goes down but <coughs> you have this kind of situation where um, similar to, to Grand Central because the, 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 the main metro there is a transit space for about half a million people like then go to different places. So then after looking at the map and, and mapping the different sort of land use and technical aspects, we did, um, which are the, those images that you see here in red, we, uh, we did a sort of programmatic intervention on different uh, aspects. And one was redesigning this grand axe, which is the historical axis that was set up uh, in the Renaissance and then prolonged by <coughs> emperors, uh, kings, emperors, and then now presidents. That goes from the Louvre, and now it goes beyond Nanterre. And it's something that you perceive when you're on the top of a tower, but you don't necessarily perceive when you're a pedestrian. Then another important point was to bring in nature in a way that it's like nat natural nature or artificial nature. So this is the definition of the Grand Axe. Then looking specifically at this sort of central space over there that can be connected, that could be connected at ground level with the neighboring um, cities. And then look also importantly at the series of like marginal spaces and spaces we, we found 10,000 square meters, which, which are about, uh, you know, help me, Lorraine, in feet. 10,000 square meters? Yeah. <coughs> The, 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 the client didn't know they had uh, in, in between above and below in this sort of liminal uh, condition uh, and that um, and that in a way you know could host activities that are not at quarters of bank or insurance or, or and, and make the place more attractive more uh, edgier and sort of hip um, for free of course like sort of offering space for for free, so that's what we did, and then we also went went on to study thematically, really, like all elements of urban design, streetscape, and planting, cultural activities, and, and you know the nature of the sites throughout different times and seasonality of the of the year, and an art collect an open air art collection that is already present on site, and now this could evolve uh, lighting and, and and so forth. So it was really like a kind of gigantic project um, and then I, I kind of speed up then then in the same site so the same week we, we win a competition to design a public space over, over there so that's the Grand Arche <coughs> that was opened by Mitterrand in 89 
and then here, like that's the back of it. So that was it. At the time, that was it. There was just this, this jetty designed by Paul Shemitov, a very nice garden designed by Gilles Clément. But it was like meant to be. And then you can see here, these are two cemeteries that are impossible to move, and this. This space here was the only vacant available space to build in a sort of Wembley arena for, for Paris. It's a rugby arena, but it's also like a music venue. So our retro planning was done by a Lady Gaga concert that turned into a Mick Jagger concert that sort of gave the planning, you know, and we had to speed up because um, the Rolling Stones were coming. And so it's like a rugby music venue, mixed use space that was built there. <coughs> and so the public space was built on this occasion. And on this side here, the city is completely developed. But this site was left like uh, left over. This was the first image. Ah, so I, I forgot mentioning that that was built by Christian Potson Park. And then Farshid Musavi built like another building there. Um, housing there. And then Tom Main had designed the tower over there, which is not built for now, then there's business school coming, and blah, blah, blah. And so the principle here was to, very simple, like to have, um, there's, a, there's a difference in level, even here of 15 meters, which is quite big from, from the beginning to the end. This is long, about 800 meters, so it's quite long. The initial master plan, call for big disruption at one point. Not only you have this difference in level, but also you have heavy um, infrastructure below. Heating pump, very complicated and expensive to move. You could move it, but it's not really what the client wanted for time frame issues and budget issues. So the master planning that we received had this big monumental staircase just in the middle, but that I felt, you know, that if you want to like do an urban culture uh, and sort of connect connect two different areas of Paris, and also symbolically, because you want to connect the banlieue, the outskirts with central Paris, that is always a bit, true la defense, that is always a bit intimidating for those living in the banlieue. So like to have like a big stare that it's like against fluidity wouldn't be the, uh, the thing. And so, and then uh, um, also you can see, uh, this, this ramp over, over there is very, is very much non-linear. No, it's very, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of um, inclined plans, uh, which are all given by the constraints. So in, in a way, I, I did like the idea of having this, this ramp instead of a stair, so the steel stair in one point, that is less than 4%, so it's like more hospitable as well. You don't have you know, this, this interruption. Then the ramp becomes the <coughs> roof of a building. You've seen a swimming pool in, in an image before, so you can host the nice things that even pay for the public realm above through the programs that you put underground. Um, and, uh, and then this idea, this, this idea of frames of like sort of a particular rhythm. And then the second point was like uh, intensifying the garden just in one point and then also making space for, for, for follies. And here you can see like an image of the plan. Um, another image, so the principle was to use this, this, this same uh, element in paving. Let me go back once, it's good. <laughs> that is always the same, but has different, different colors and different finishes. So there's different five types of them, uh, you can see this image. And then to, um, uh, to put different percentages of each paving um, in place so that there's a sort of vibration that is created, but in a very simple way. And then the same trapezoidal shape is, is used also for handrails, is used also for, or for, other, um, for other elements uh, throughout, the, throughout the site. So this is a bit. And then you can see these this, this, this little red things are, in fact, like um, elements that were existing. It's like the ventilation stations for <coughs> whatever is underneath. So it's something that was not avoidable. But instead of camouflaging them with like sort of plants and things, so we said, since we have to have them, then, then let's go with like sort of paint and, and do like urban sports. So this is a climbing wall, and there's another one that's for skating and, 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 and so forth. Or sometimes, you know, sort of some elements are integrated into the, 
dictating. <coughs> and then the nature is like the planting, new planting is very limited because there's already biodiversity given by all the trees in the cemeteries. And then we introduce this, this red color. Here again, you see all these ventilation stations. And, um, to make this grayness of La Défense vibrate um, a bit, to challenge it a bit, so it's already it's almost like pale. So these are images at the time where the, like, the um, site was not yet com completely completed, um, but it can, it can give you an idea of what, how, it is, it, how it is now. So it's like really dealing also with a lot of things that are already there. And here you can see this, this bridge nature, this infrastructural nature of the ramp, uh, it's like floating, floating above and below. There's a there's a building, there's a program. And that's the Christian de Park Stadium for Shibusabi over there. We don't have the main tower is not there um, yet. So that's it. And it's it's you know you you, you think it's mostly bi-dimensional and then some urban. Um, you know, some design of the, we designed the benches, we designed the, um, the, the, the lighting elements as well, but it's mostly, you know, sort of paving and there, but it's an extremely uh, complex project. It's much more difficult to design a project like this and to build a project like this because of the infrastructural nature of the site than, you know, the building we've seen yeah. right at the beginning. That's the first image that you see. No, I, I, sp I speed up, or you tell me if I'm, I'm being too long. This is like, uh, just in a few images, it's a new project I've been working more recently for an art district in, in Liverpool in the UK. As you know, Liverpool was extensively bombed um, and then underwent shrinking and underwent an economic crisis that was quite... It never recovered the Second World War bombing and, and then Margaret Thatcher suggested that they should manage decline, and then Man Manchester was too close and was being redeveloped. So, uh, but recently, Liverpool has seen a sort of renaissance due to the art for the presence of Tate, the presence of other um, cultural institutions, uh, a street in Liverpool um, redesigned by Assemble, won the Turner Prize for the arts. So it's it's like a big a hot place for art. And so here I was asked by some developers, not by the council, to look at this place that is a UNESCO heritage site. It's a very beautiful site on, on the docks and uh, very bricky and with some of the biggest um, bricks buildings in, in, in the world. That's a former tobacco factory <coughs> that this Irish developer owned. Um, and then with this fabric of like uh, smaller warehouses uh, underneath and to, I was asked to look at it and to make some images. At first they asked me some images to go and talk with the city and to sort of redevelop it, it in the art district and design district, a bit like Miami design district. And I said, well, you can't really... Um, so this is like a pre-public consultation video. I'm, I'm just showing it. It's It's very advertising driven and it doesn't show um, the specifics of it because because you don't want to show in a public consultation things the two specifics but you have an idea of, of um, the drone images can give you an idea of, of the site so central Liverpool is over there this is a place that is called Liverpool Waters that is going to develop as a sort of Dubai um, with like very high rise towers so and and in the site um, I think I can skip it. Um, what I was um, thinking is like retaining the, the existing urban fabric. So I started looking at the. I said to the developers, "Well, you need a, you know, so you need to think about the plan, and you can't just do um, an image. You know, but it's quite devoid of sense and, and, and meaning." So here I started looking at what was demolishable or not, what is sort of what was listed or not, and, and finally. Um, you know, all the red could be, in principle, <coughs> demolished. But I, I, I took the decision of like uh, keeping as much as I could of the existing fabric, and especially of the fabric and the shape of the of the streets, um, not to build uh, like a tabula rasa, but to to build on what was already uh, there, and then insert new typologies that would be sympathetic with the materials and would be sympathetic with the nature and the spirit <laughs> of the site. Um, but um, 
adapting, adapting the typologies and their sizes and shrinking and enlarging uh, to, to adapt to the, to the site. And so first I, I did the plan and opening up, giving also great, great importance to the public realm and building two, <coughs> two squares. And, um, and that's one of the few images that was ever shown and like where you see this, this juxtaposition of old, almost left old, not too much cleaned and new Davidson, sort of sympathetic. Again, this is not a design project, but you suggest the kind of architecture that you would want. And, and the program is mixed use, so you have art galleries, you have the first revolving theater in the UK, you have um, a campus, a university, new mobility hub, but also um, you know offices more like, it's not uniquely arts, it's arts and digital and, and, and tech, and housing as well, so you have like a view from the side. Right now this is this was adopted as a result of our work and now it's evolving in opportunity plans and following up, you know, the, the, the sites and the land that is available to to development. Mm -hmm. The final two projects are <laughs> completely different scale. This is a project I'm very happy I've done for the Fran uh, for the Italian embassy in uh, um, in Paris, the Louvre was the cu acting as curator and uh, and with the collaboration of Prada, uh, but that's not me. <coughs> that's Carlos Carpa and um, mm, the Francesco Laurana uh, bus. That's what, that's an important reference for me because it's it's a uh, it's the work of Scarpa Palazzo Batellis in, in in Palermo in Sicily, and and what is important what it does here. This is a project that has over 50 years. I, I mean, now, um, so it's not a new project, but it's a very powerful project that shows also the juxtaposition of several layers of not only works of art, but also the palazzo, but at least uh, per se, and then the, the showcases, so what Scarpa designs. And in particular, this sculpture is put in space against uh, a, green, um, a green wall, a sort of green screen, and this air in between, so like spatially very, very interesting. And that was the with those, this collage on Miss Van der Rohe that have a similar quality for another uh, reason that gives, you know, the the principle of the project. So that's that's a drawing that I did right at the beginning. Um, so I have this residency of the ambassador. It's not a cultural center. It's all full of rocaille. It's very gold and greens and grays. It's mirrors. Uh, Sicilian theater, in, and, and I was first approached by the embassy just to design the, the, the set of a, of a tiny Leonardo da Vinci painting. It's a disheveled air lady, you might have seen it was here at the Met three years ago or something. So it's very tiny, it's, it's like this, but it's quite relevant um, painting. This is like the chinoiserie that were set in there, and then and then from like just this one painting, um, about more than a dozen were, were grouped in the space of like not even six months, right? Really, with sort of, that's very Italian, the disability to do things against deadline and very last minute and against all odds. But it was a pleasure to, you know, to, to work for this project. And especially because those paintings were coming, it's all Leonardo da Vinci and then sometimes Salai were like the best pupils, maybe lovers of, of Leonardo. <coughs> and uh, they all come from different museums. And, uh, um, and this, my brief year, set up by the ambassador and his wife and the curators um, at the Louvre, but also with the supervision of Prada that was like also involved mostly in the financing of this <coughs> show, temporary show for the 500 years of Leonardo da Vinci in, um, in France. Um, and so the brief was to do something contemporary, to do something that would, you know, like um, make the work of Leonardo stand up, but in a, in a space that is a no white wall space, it's a not a neutral space, and then to create a sort of spatial promenade in this uh, in this room, so and also like keeping what is in its, its reception room, so it's very velvety and so forth. So I came up with this idea of, of frames, again, frames that are like polished steel, so they, they, they mirror all the environment and then they're set against this white 
walls and pedestals that are also there for <coughs> for security, but also to create a sort of sequence. And so the, all the paintings that are you, you can see they are in a plexiglass box, and that's for conservation things. It's not a design; it's not particularly a design decision. But all these paintings are floating, and you can also see not only the sequence in space, but you can also see the um, the the back of the paintings. These are two very beautiful St. John's. You can see in this image how you know rich the environment is and also how different the scale of this project is from the previous project. It's almost like <coughs> the scale of you know designing an object. But it's something I very much I very much enjoyed and had a very critical acclaim from the different curators of the of the museum which was that's a Codex Atlanticus as well and that's finally the the scapigliata, the disheveled um, hair lady. Last one, tiny project that I did, so uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of L'Artigue, which is like a giant photographer, who became relevant as a photographer at the end of his life, really, because he'd been, he'd been taking photographs all, all his <coughs> life, but his main occupation was being a painter. He was very privileged from his father was a banker, I think. He was living in between two war wars. <coughs> and from his diaries, you don't even you don't even feel the spin of war. It's all about beau, très beau, très très beau. And his life was made of beautiful women. This this is one of his three wives, the model. And uh, galas, this is the <coughs> galas. He designed all the sets of these hundreds of butterflies or balloons or things in Cannes then doing commissions for Maxime, doing apartments for, for artists here in New York, and then being on vacation quite a lot of time, and then making photos of all of these vacations and sort of car races and tennis playing, and the photos are beautiful. So it was discovered, I think, here in the US. If I'm not wrong, it, I think it's a curator at the moment, but it, came, it became really big in photography when he was already 69, after doing quite mediocre painting, I mean, in my, in my opinion, and I know we don't want the foundation to this IO. I don't know if I'm being registered or not, but that's, that's in my, my opinion, these paintings that are not so great were like um, essential for him to become a fantastic uh, photographer. But this show that is a very, very tiny show, it's a, it's a very modest budget that uh, I, I designed and I just opened this summer in Paris, is about his relationship with, <coughs> with fashion, with Carven in particular. He was a close friend of uh, Madame Carven, so he was on holidays and, and this is also very, very extensively reported in, in his work. And then he painted, he painted and he did like um, silk patterns that were used then by not only Carvan, for Carvan he, he used to do drawings that were not always used, but throughout, you know, very early, these, these are from early, I think it's 1912 or something, he starts sketching fashion and then photographing and then doing those patterns for, these are patterns for pillows, very beautiful designs, and, and here my intervention is really like working with tiny budgets and, um, and quite difficult spaces with low ceilings and, and lots of colors to, to, to really give relevance to... It's in a beautiful building, the, the setting was a beautiful building, but the interior was quite uh, contrived, um, with these beautiful and materials that have, have never been seen before, so nobody has ever um, seen it. This is a Schiaparelli dress that is, is designed the pattern of, so the patterns are very floral. Um, as well, and these are all the silk, the silk samples from that were done in in, uh, in Lyon. So that's it. And then I don't know if Sonia Limer has uh, arrived because I wanted to show you very um, something that is in this other computer, something that we've been doing here at the um, at the, um, the Cooper. This collaboration. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> this artist, Sonia, Sonia Leimer, and that was also the... I don't know, can you please just help me to connect? Um, that would be very quick, but... Um, yeah, is it... Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so that, that was easy. So we did this studio looking at Mulberry Street, Chinatown, and, um, and um, some of the designs that were developed by students here at the Cooper Union that were now um, uh, are on showcase in this exhibition at ISCP. Um, in Brooklyn, that is opening uh, next week on the 17th. Here, I think there's the work of Karina Shikova uh, and uh, Hester Atto. Um, but also the, the research booklets where uh, we don't have audio. Yeah, of course. Hmm? Selling everything from the But also the research, the research um, that we did. Um, is also will, will also be partially presented uh, in this exhibition and I'm writing the for the catalog. So this is like um, a short film that Sonia did. A hundred thousand people. <laughs> it's with about push uh, selling everything from food and items on the street and Italian Americans Italy. from across mostly southern Italy on Mulberry Street. And Part of that was That's Tony Di Nonno, that it's a puppet, puppeteer and filmmaker. On these <laughs> hallowed grounds from 1920 to 1937, every night Orlando stood on the stage and entranced and enlightened and captivated audiences by Papa Agrippino Manteo and his wonderful Manteo family. They were lovely. They were artisans. They were magnificent actors, theatrical performers, painters, set designers, all embodied in one. It was unforgettable. People would come every night and the marionette story were the stories and the sages of a thousand years old. My name is Orlando Furioso which means Angry Orlando. I was a member of the famous Manteo Puppet Theater before it closed. The audience loved me for my generosity and miraculous powers. I was the embodiment of a knightly cavalier. I was made by Ida and Mike Manteo in 1980. They used materials that they recycled from the streets of Little Italy. Ida sewed my garment from old fabrics. Mike made my metal armor from a broken grill that he found in the streets. Together, they painted my face. <laughs> Here I am with my current owner, Tommy the Nonno. Tommy is a filmmaker who made a movie about the Manteo family in 1979. It was a portrait of an era about to end. After the filming, Mike Manteo gave me as a present to Tony, wishing that he would keep the tradition alive. Behind us, you see the site of the Manteo Theater, now a construction site for a condominium building. Back in the 20s, the monthly rent was $15, but for this amount now, you can maybe buy a cappuccino. The same site looked like this in the 1920s. Way down on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, far removed from the edge in bright lights of Broadway, is a little Italian theater where every night is portrayed an episode in the life of Charlotte. The entire story runs for 15 months continuously. My mother was at the box office, my father and my sister doing the voices, and four sons were rich. 
It was a family tradition. This is the voice of Mike Manteo. I was the number one manipulator on that bridge, and I was teaching my brothers. My sister, woman that she is, this is Ida Manteo. And this is me with Mike, back in 1980, and filmed by Tony. This is Orlando Il Furioso. This is the Captain General of the French Army. He's a very strong knight. Every time he fights the enemy, he always wins. You see? 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 You like him? That's Orlando Il Furioso. Can you say that, Michael? Orlando Il Furioso. Say it. Orlando Il Furioso. Some of my former colleagues are stored in the basement of Ida Manteo's daughter, Susie's house. Once our performances were so vivid that the audience forgot that they were watching a play. One day, a visitor even shot a puppet to help the other one win. <laughs> But since the theater closed in 1983, my friends lost their purpose. Now I am the only one from the old crew that is still walking the streets of Little Italy. And this is Mother Street. It crosses the old center of Little Italy. Tony's parents were born at the south end of Mother Street, close to where the Manteo Puppet Theater was located. Mulberry Street was Neapolitan. The Sicilians lived on Elizabeth Street and the Calabris and Apulians on Mott Street. It took a long time for these borders to be lifted and much longer for the Italian immigrants to be counted as New Yorkers. Nowadays, this area is a part of Chinatown as the population of Chinatown grew in the 70s. The neighborhood expanded in all directions. Chinese business owners purchased properties in Little Italy, resulting in today's culturally diverse neighborhood, where the border between the two neighborhoods is blurred. Now, Little Italy is better known for its concentration of Italian restaurants than for its dwindling Italian-American population. But, once a year, on the day of the Feast of San Gennaro, Mulberry Street is still called Via San Gennaro. This tradition was brought to New York City by Neapolitan immigrants and has been celebrated since 1926. And every year on that day, Tony takes me out for a walk amongst the thousands of visitors. <laughs> So, and this, these are some of the, the work of the students here that were then modeled in 3D and inserted in, in, in the film. So this is Karina's cinema theater. Little Italy has changed so much since I knew it. And it will continue to change and transform. But I wonder what this future will look like. Sometimes, I dream of it. In one of my dreams, I walked through the neighborhood and passed by an open architectural space that was something like a museum or a cinema. It contained all the movies that had ever been shot in Little Italy. Scorsese, Newell, Coppola, Duggan, all of them. You could sit on the stairs 
and watch movie scenes that were projected onto the walls of the adjacent buildings. This is the project by Esther Atto. In another dream, Little Italy was devoid of anything Italian. Even the restaurants were gone. Money had pushed everything out. High-rise buildings for luxurious apartments were built. And the only building that reminded me of the history of Italian, Chinese, Jewish, German and Irish immigration was a memorial for the tenement houses. The memorial consisted of a tenement house without any apartments. All that was left was the narrow light well framing the sky. I think that's that's it.